So how are you all feeling this morning? Good? Yes? Who had coffee somewhere in Melbourne this morning? Everyone? Great. I'm glad you found some good coffee places. I also saw some fantastic photos that were taken from just out here. So if you do get a chance sometime today and you want to break during any of the morning teas, jump outside and have a look down there. It looks really, really cool. Um, now, I also have to make a public apology. A couple of people have come to me this morning telling me that it's Arnett, not Arnett. So I'm terribly sorry about that. David only informed me at about afternoon tea time yesterday that it is Arnett. So I promise that I will say Arnett for the rest of the day. Um, so first up to kick us off for the day, we've got Warwick Mitchell. So Warwick is joining us from Perth. Where is he? It's just in front there. Warwick is joining us from Perth. I found out that one of the most interesting things he started off doing was uh, writing articles on how to connect all your computers via LAN so you could play Doom on your home internet. So that was pretty cool. Um, so Warwick is going to talk to us about connecting to IWS and Azure and will kick us off for the day for some fantastic talks. Thanks, Warwick. Morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, that was when I was young, um, <laughs> very young. <laughs> Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about connecting to AWS, Microsoft Azure, and something that came out last night, Google Cloud in Sydney. Um, so I'm not sure if you saw the announcement, but uh, they have actually uh, created a cloud compute service in Sydney, and they are still working on how they're going to do the connections outside of VPNs at the moment, uh, but uh, we'll go through that and discuss it uh, a little bit later. So... Uh, All right, so we've basically got those three topics and then questions. So we're going to start off with Amazon. So basically, I think most people are aware of Amazon. Who actually uses Amazon today? All right, who has their own direct connects themselves? Who uses Arnett's direct connect? Okay, right, so there's a couple of different ways that we can do it. So at the moment, there is, you can connect to um, AWS over the internet using VPNs, or you can go over the public interface, which is to the, uh, the web interfaces for, say, Qantas's website, banks, a few other bits and pieces. Or you can do uh, connections via Rnet uh, privately on layer two or layer three. Now, <coughs> I'm gonna highlight, I'm gonna highlight just here. You'll notice that the layer two doesn't say VPN. It says layer two or layer three VPN. There's a couple of things there. One is that we can connect you optically. So we'll basically just simply uh, submit a letter of authorization uh, to connect uh, to Amazon and actually just simply optically pass you the circuit from their premises all the way to you, uh, wherever that might be. So uh, currently we peer with Amazon in a number of places. Um, we peer with them internationally uh, over both the peering points and over a p and I in the United States. Uh, we are peering with them at peering points in Australia. However, that's about to change. We're going to get some direct p and I's. So p and I's are uh, private network interconnects. Um, we also have our own private direct connect service and uh, that allows us to offer services at sub-rate speed. So when I say sub-rates, that's uh, 200 meg, 500 meg, uh, just under a gig, or it's two gig, five gig, that sort of thing. Um, or if you want, you can buy your own direct connect and we'll connect you optically or over a layer two circuit uh, at one gig or 10 gig. So what is Direct Connect? I'm pretty sure you all know this, but Direct Connect is just basically a way of accessing Amazon without going over the, uh, over the public internet. The biggest advantage for that is that you have direct connectivity between you and Amazon. Uh, now, there are some, some interesting parts that come with that. Um, as we go forward, uh, there are three handoff locations in, in Australia. I was about to say Sydney, but I needed to clarify this. So the, the two main handoff points are in Sydney, that is Equinix and Global Switch, but there's also Next DC Melbourne. But when you go and look at the Amazon's website, it doesn't say Melbourne. It says there's three location handoffs in Australia. But what, what they're trying to say is that the actual data center and the actual compute and everything is actually in Sydney. They've just created a port 
for you to connect to in Melbourne that then gets transferred up to Sydney. So just something to keep in mind if you're looking at Melbourne going, that'll be a great way to connect. So basically there's a couple of things that a lot of people don't know about the Direct Connect product, and that is that there is an option for a public and a private. So you can create a private connection, which is basically the blue line here, uh, going inside to your EC2 instances, your databases, whatever you might want to put, an elastic uh, search or bits and pieces. And then you've got the public, which is this bit here, going toward the Amazon S3 and the Glacier side. There's also a whole bunch of things that fall under this bit here, which people don't realise, which is when you go to, say, Netflix, a lot of Netflix con content comes from the public side of AWS. It's the actual source of the, the files. The other parts are you've got uh, banks, Qantas, as I've said, um, stock exchange companies, other bits and pieces that all host their infrastructure in the public. So when you think about getting a connection and you're thinking about being able to access, say, uh, a cloud backup provider that happens to be hosted on AWS, be careful what you wish for. If you connect it to your network via a private direct, sorry, via a direct connect that's on the public side, you will also get every other bit of public AWS traffic via that path. So you can't just simply go, oh yeah, it's trusted because I know what it is. You don't. It's a lot of other things that you're not expecting. So there's a couple of different redundancy models. Uh, firstly, there is the version of uh, Direct Connect where you don't actually need to have a secondary connection at all. You just simply have a single connection. And that's up to you if you want to do that. You may have all of your customers accessing your content via a public internet gateway off AWS itself here. Or you can do this model, which is to get your data center to have diversity into the actual VPC. Now, if you read through the Amazon documentation, they refer to the fact that you need to make sure that you connect into two different direct connect locations for the fact that there is no redundancy at the router level here. So if you look at the AWS product, it has regions and availability zones, but you're still stuck with the good old fashioned, it's a router port here. If that fails, you're off. So if you're going to go with redundancy, think about it, and you may actually find that you want two direct connects to two different locations. Following on from that is the other option that they offer, which has some drawbacks. Uh, the main drawback here is the VPN connection, instead of a direct connect, is the fact that it is only capable of handling a few hundred megabits a second of traffic. Anything more than that, you are basically wasting your time. You're not going to be able to handle it. Um, their equipment won't handle it, and you'll want to be replacing that if you're doing serious bandwidth. So, why have multiple VPCs? So, one of the questions that I get asked a lot is why, why should we have multiple VPCs? How do I break out my billing when it comes to AWS? By having separated VPCs, you can fire up instances inside that VPC and say that is my development team. And so you can actually see on the bill that that, that team has actually attributed the so many co this particular cost set. So, for example, if I was to say, hypothetically want to fire up, say, Zoom servers in AWS. I'm going to use that as an example here. I might want to create a VPC that I know is Paul's so that I know that I can attribute the bill to him. Um, and then I would fire up all of the instances in that and then on the bill it does come out and it gives me that breakdown of knowing how much he's used and how much it's costing the business uh, versus, say, for example, if I was to fire up a uh, another VPC here for, say, uh, let's just say we were going to do an end map of the network or something to that effect. This would be very minimal, this would be significant because it's the Zoom servers, and this might be a case of uh, maybe a Nagios server or something that's actually polling the network. So that's the reasons behind having multiple VPCs. So, why does regional selection matter? Um, it's interesting on a number of fronts. Some people like to use AWS to actually identify when things happen on their network by polling from external. So you may have campuses that are in, uh, I'm gonna use an example here, say South Africa. Oops, that's not South Africa, sorry. Yep. Um, 
yeah, we'll just use the US, sorry. I haven't had enough coffee. Um, so you may have campuses in the US or say in Asia. You may want to actually see how long it takes to get from AWS to there to do your monitoring to make sure your systems are alive. Now, the other thing to note with this slide, and it's probably very hard to see, is just down here, you'll notice there's a number in a bracket after each of the words. Those numbers, which are hard to read, are the number of availability zones. So, uh, which I'm going to use this to describe it. So, basically, the concept of an availability zone is that if you were to draw a line physically here through the middle of this, all of this infrastructure up here is on completely different power. It's in a completely different location. It's not in the same rack set. It's not in the same cage. It's separated. Whereas this gear is in a different row or a different row of racks or a different hall in the data center uh, on a different set of power feeds so that they can actually make sure that there is the availability. Should this fail, these guys will take over, and vice versa. If you have a look at Sydney, for example, AWS actually has a third availability zone and they're split over the two data centers so that there is that redundancy level available if you want to use that. So here are some key takeaways after a couple of years of playing with Amazon. Um, first thing, you cannot use AWS without BGP. If you want to try and connect it at layer two, it isn't going to work, they won't let you. They'll simply turn around and say, get something that speaks BGP. They also have some really useful tools to generate the BGP config if you're not confident with creating BGP config. You fill in a couple of things and it'll produce a list of configs based on a Cisco, a Juniper, any particular type of uh, bits and pieces. One of the things that's quite cool about AWS is that AWS supports bidirectional forward detection, uh, or BFD. Uh, and basically, they have uh, deployed that so that you can fast fail over between sites if something does occur. Um, highly recommend you use that rather than tuning your BGP timers down. It just makes life easier. Uh, if you want to access the public side of AWS, um, you can do it uh, using both a private ASN or a public ASN. They will restrict what private ASNs they'll accept. Um, however, you must use a public IP address that you own. So a classic example of this is if you have your IP addresses announced by Arnet AS7575, the first thing Amazon's going to do is go, go to Arnet because they, they believe we own the IP address because we are the origination of it. So something to keep in mind if you're using private ASs to talk to Arnet. The other thing that's probably interesting for some people, in, and I don't know why you'd want to do this, but I have seen a couple of people try, um, to utilize VPNs instead of Direct Connect. Um, Amazon will not let you do that. Amazon prefers Direct Connects absolutely over the VPNs. Uh, so if you're trying to do that, and I can't see why you would, um, it's not going to work uh, unless you actually turn off your Direct Connect. The other thing that was interesting is recently there was an announcement, I think it was six months ago, oops, sorry, that uh, IPv6 is now available within the AWS functionality. Uh, it's not fully supported in all areas, but it is in the majority of areas it's available for you to use on an EC2 instance, databases, uh, public internet, uh, and a few other bits and pieces. So if you want to try turning on only IPv6 in your AWS instance, you can do now, uh, which is good. Um, again, think about availability zones when you're building out your uh, infrastructure mainly because of the fact that you don't want to have the situation that happened a year and a half ago. Uh, Amazon had a failure in one of its availability zones and people had built every single piece of their infrastructure in that one availability zone and wondered why everything went off the air. Um, uh, so it's advisable to make sure you actually pay attention to that. Um, also, don't forget with Amazon, everything's done via VLAN. So there is a VLAN from you to Amazon and then a BGP session over that. Make sure that you keep that unique. You don't want to overlap that within your own network. Uh, other thing that was interesting is Amazon can now offer up to 40 gigs of direct connect. But you have to bundle 14 gigs, which is not useful if you're trying to upload 
single flow large data sets because you're going to still get limited to 10 gig. Um, there are plans apparently in AWS's minds to upgrade to 100 gig interfaces and I welcome any of you to say to us please do this um, because we'd like to have that challenge. Uh, the other thing again as I said is uh, attributing specific costs, make sure you actually apply that to a particular VPC, that way you can break out the bill for a, uh, a business unit. And for full redundancy make sure you look at getting your handoffs in different locations. But finally my biggest tip is the fact that set up billing alerts. The amount of people that get a big shock at the end of the month when they get a huge bill from AWS because they haven't thought things through is phenomenal. So within Arnet ourselves, I have it set up so that I get two alerts, and myself and a few others, so that we know that at roughly the 15th day of the month we should get a notification saying that we're halfway through what we're expecting for the month. Now we're a little different in the sense that we are doing it on direct connect so we know that that's a fixed cost, it's a fixed price per hour, we know how many hours are in a month, we can roughly work it out. If you're using dynamic services it becomes a bit more of a challenge but I still recommend that you set the alerts. Um, and then I have one that should arrive roughly about the 28th day of the month to say that you're at your peak maximum of what you're expecting for the month which is just a, a nice sanity check to make sure that our bill is what we're expecting and that someone hasn't left a machine fired up and doing something that shouldn't be. So we're now going to talk about Microsoft Azure. So out of curiosity, who wants to play with Azure? Seriously, is that all? Or, or are you just not putting your hands up high enough? Okay, who are playing with Azure? All right, who wants to play with Azure? Okay. So Azure, Azure is a very different subject. Um, a lot of people think it's like AWS, but it's different. There are going to be a few things that might surprise you when we talk about this. So you'll recognise this diagram. I'm going to keep using it. It's pretty similar to the last one. In this case, it says Microsoft. So in this particular case, we can provide you with a connectivity towards Microsoft, but you don't physically connect with Microsoft. We, we connect with Microsoft. Everything is done over our network on a layer 2 or a layer 3 VPN. There's no optical circuits involved. We physically connect. Now, currently, we connect to Microsoft in a number of places. Uh, New South Wales, Victoria and WA. And I'll just run back through a little bit of history here to explain why. Uh, back in the days when Microsoft offered the university's Outlook uh, for students and so forth, there was a huge issue in how you got to Microsoft and it being on net versus off net. And so basically Microsoft worked with Arnet and the universities and basically we got three peering connections in Australia that connected us to the Microsoft network to get to the content that's in Singapore, Hong Kong, depending on where you're tenanted. Uh, nowadays they've expanded that to be outside of just the academics. It's now open to peering across various peering points to TPG, INET, all those guys, uh, other bits and pieces. And I just realised they're both the same company. Um, Telstra, Optus, etc. So, uh, what is ExpressRoute? So, ExpressRoute connections are things that, again, don't travel over the internet. Um, now, this is directly from Microsoft. I do chuckle because of the fact that one of their lines is that it's more reliable, faster, lower latency and higher security than typical internet connections. I think the word typical does not apply to Arnet. Um, we have more connections to them than they do to the rest of Australia. Uh, we are quite close in terms of latency and we've proved that not time and time again. But they're now offering more and more services within Australia and there's still the fact that they still have some customers tenanted in Singapore, Hong Kong uh, in other locations. So currently there are two handoff locations. As I said, these are not handoff locations that you get connected to. These are handoff locations that Arnet gets connected to and I'll explain that in a second. So again, this time it's in SID2 at Equidix and it's at NextDC M1 in Melbourne. So this is why I said there's a big difference between AWS and Azure. So the biggest difference is that you can't connect directly. Uh, Arnet is basically the interface to Microsoft. 
and you can't just go and order a service without going through us. So I'll explain this a bit further as we go. But basically, Arnet has at the moment four 10 gig links to Azure, two in Melbourne, two in Sydney. They will grow as we grow in terms of usage. Uh, basically, we can deliver, the, deliver connections to you in two different fashions. One is a layer two VPN, and the way in which that works, I'll explain a bit further. Uh, and then a layer three VPN if you don't want to do the routing between yourself and Microsoft, if you need us to do it to help you along. That's an option that's available. Uh, services now, if you read the Microsoft website, these numbers don't match Microsoft's. I'm, I took these from the Arnet website. These are the services we offer. So there is a smaller set of speeds you can buy from Azure, but we don't offer those as a VPN product. So if you want smaller speeds, you're gonna have to try and convince someone to, to accept that from us. Uh, the other thing, and it's probably the biggest line here, I should have bolded it, is that the shared 10 gig ports have an oversubscription ratio of four to one. That is a Microsoft subscription, oversubscription policy. That is not an Arnet policy. We've actually argued with them time and time again about it. I need to go back and double check this figure here because there was a recent update where they were talking about it potentially being two to one, which is still, it's an improvement, but it's still not the best. So this is, this is from Microsoft's documentation on how it works. So basically, in each location, there is a Microsoft Edge. Uh, and in each edge, there's really, there's two separate edges. I've just, the diagram's just showing them combined as one. So there's edge one, there's edge two. Then there's the partner edge, and there's edge one, edge two for the partner. So the partner being Arnet. Basically, there is diversity between there and there physically within the data center. That's part of the, the equation that comes with uh, Azure. So you can get traffic to the Office 365 services. You can get access to the public IP addresses in Azure. So if you're hosting your own infrastructure in Azure, you can do that and you can get it directly to you on your campus without actually going over the public internet and still have it so that those addresses are accessible for your students from home. The other thing is you can have traffic to virtual networks such as this down here which don't have any access to the outside world. So, talking about redundancy, this kind of gives you an idea of where I was going earlier. So there is these two ports here. So this is the primary connection, this is the secondary connection. When you go to order a redundant service from Microsoft in the portal, you will find that it will, t if you select say Melbourne, and you say I want full redundancy, it's going to create both circuits in Melbourne not one in Melbourne, one in Sydney, just to be clear. The reason for that is that as far as Microsoft is concerned, their network there and here is completely diverse inside the data center. It's in different halls, different power, the whole lot. And that the provider, the partner edge is also considered to be diverse. So it's meant, meant to be on different routers on our side here. Now, in Sydney, that is correct today. In Melbourne, it's currently in progress. We're just waiting on a fibre build. Uh, but then that will be truly diverse. Now, the second option for redundancy, very similar to AWS, is having a, an express route for your primary data and then having a VPN gateway. Again, same exact issues with AWS. It is, it is performance driven. It can't go over a few hundred megabits. Um, so it's not actually recommended if you're doing high-scale deployments. Now this is uh, slightly different, and again, everything with AWS and Azure has to be different. Um, Microsoft came out with the product and went, oh, customers want multi, the ability to put multiple VPCs or networks in. Um, so what they did is they then added this functionality to virtual network gateways, multiples, into a uh, an express route connection. An important piece to note is that Microsoft impose a default limit of 10 networks maximum unless you apply to them in writing to get that raised. And writing is email. It's not a web page or anything like that. In fact, a number of things require you to contact Microsoft for them to lift limits. It's very unuser friendly compared to the AWS system where you can basically go for broke. 
So this is where it gets a little different in terms of ordering a service. So in, in an AWS service, you would basically go out and order a 10 gig interface. Uh, you would say on AWS, if you were doing it yourself, you would go into the AWS portal, go, I want to create a direct connect, I want it at this data center, and you would click a button, and the AWS portal will produce a letter of authority. That letter of authority, then you would send that to Arnet and say, I want to patch this and bring it to my network. We'd go, no worries, here we go, here's your cost, and we'd build the circuit. In Microsoft's case, there's a little bit of a different process around that. So, one, you need to create your Azure subscription. You then need to conf uh, confirm that you know who the uh, connectivity provider is, that would be us, uh, that we have, and you that have physical connectivity with the provider. Now, this is where Arnet says that's a bit silly. We're not going to build something until you tell us to. It, there's no point otherwise. So, here's where it gets interesting. When you go to order the express route circuit, what you need to do is you need to contact Arnet first. You need to say, I want to buy a service to Azure. This is what I'm going to order. And there are a few bits that I'll go through in a second. And you need to make sure that we know that in advance because the moment you click go on Azure, you are paying for that service. It does not wait until we connect it. It doesn't anything. It is immediately billed from that point onwards. So first thing you need to do is obviously work out what bandwidth you want. If you're going to buy a 50 meg circuit from Azure, but you have to buy a 200 meg circuit from Arnet, these are the common questions you should be asking. Uh, then you select your internal billing mode uh, model, and then there is the standard or premium add-ons. Again, everything's an additional feature. Uh, so if you want to have certain features within a Azure, you need to turn these on. Uh, then you the, uh, provide the service key to Arnet. This is this section up here. This is what tells us what the details are for the circuit. We don't actually see, a, in a portal, we don't actually see uh, that Deacon wants to connect or Latrobe wants to connect. We see a really randomly long string of numbers. Um, and basically, we then get from that a S tag and a C tag. So just quickly, who understands uh, .1Q in .1Q? Hopefully, this is a room of network engineers. I hope it's clear. So basically, the S tag is presented to Arnet as the service provider tag. That way, we will pass that all the way through our network, and we will give you the C tag from underneath as an interface. Or we can hand it off if there is, if it's been configured the right way, we can hand it off where we give you multiple VLANs on the same port uh, from the service. And then, obviously, as we finish, Arnet completes the circuit. We click a few buttons that says it's provisioned. At that point, you can start passing traffic over the circuit once it's done from our side. So takeaways for this. Again, I keep harping on to the fact, four to one. It's a shocker of a thing when, we, when they kind of just rolled it out at the end and said, oh, yeah, by the way. Um, again, we keep pushing for that. Azure does not support BGP with BFD. You have to lower your BGP timers to make failover work fast. Um, the official email that I got said set it to three seconds. Um, as long as you're not putting a full routing table through it, I think you'd be okay with that. If you're putting a full routing table through, I wouldn't do it. Um, again, the moment you create your service, you're gonna get billed. Uh, again, you can do the same thing as, as AWS. Um, Express Route supports private ASNs and public. That, however, they do reserve these for their own internal use, and again, Highlight of the day, set up billing alerts. You will regret if you don't. So that brings us up to the next one, which is Google Cloud Sydney. So this was announced uh, on Osnog last night after an email between Philip and I yesterday over the tables, uh, basically going, has this actually happened yet? It happened four days ago. Just Google forgot to announce it. So if you go to the Google web page, uh, it's under Cloud Compute about location Sydney. Um, I'll find the URL uh, and put it up a bit later. Uh, it basically has a video that explains what they've done. Now, basically, they've brought it here. Now, who here is from Monash? Right, so Monash features in the video um, as one of the partners for Google, so. Yeah, so it was nice that they put you guys in there and explained it. Um, so there was a few other companies that were listed in Australia as being very keen for this to happen. Uh, so this has now happened. Now, like I've explained previously, at the moment, 
Google has two things. Lots of fat pipes to Arnet, and also a VPN you can use to connect into here. But the reality is it's still going to go over a VPN. When I asked Google, are they going to offer some form of connectivity out of the cloud to a campus or to Arnet for that functionality, I was told, maybe, maybe not. Ask again in six months. We'll see what happens. Um, so the big thing there is I was predominantly asking how we could upload large data sets because small files not a problem if it goes over a VPN, but again, large data sets a bit of a problem. So who can guess how much capacity Arnet has to Google? How much? 40? No. All right, you were closer first. So at the moment, uh, Arnet has a number of connections to Google. So there is, there are, now, David Harmsworth, where are you? All right, how many connections are there in total? Four, 10 gigs? Yeah, and then that's the P&Is? Yeah. So there's 40 gig of connectivity to Google. That's going to expand to? A lot more. A lot more, okay. Uh, so we're in the process of reshifting some of our connectivity to Google uh, in the next couple of months. So I think it's going to go somewhere in the vicinity of 60 plus. Um, that gives you an idea of just how much traffic we do with Google. Um, now we peer with Google not only in Australia and get a lot of our content that way, we also peer with them in the United States. Um, and so there's a lot of traffic that we get from different locations depending on what Google has in Australia in terms of infrastructure. So that's my presentation, and I'm sorry about the Google being very light on. It, as I said, it was only announced last night, so I made the changes to the slides very early this morning, and I'm waiting on some more information to come back from Google. So are there any questions in relation to...